Welcome, everyone. We're really happy that you could join us for today's uh, seminar, uh, The Whole Truth About Dairy, Building Regenerative Solutions for People, Planet, People and Planet Without GMOs. Really excited to be joined again this year by Albert Strauss, founder and CEO of Strauss Family Creamery. We're joined this year by some new friends, Lynette Mann from Lewis, uh, Lewis Road Creamery down in New Zealand. She's kind enough to join us at what I think is 7 a.m. tomorrow, uh, to speaking to us uh, from the future. And we've got Adrian Boda, really exciting uh, uh, new regenerative organic dairy brand, new, new to me, relatively new uh, in our world uh, from, from Origin Milk. Super excited to be talking to them for the bulk of our conversation today. So welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a few minutes uh, on the actual presentation as more folks continue to come into the seminar. Just a few preliminaries here. I'm Hans Eisenbeis from the Non-GMO Project. I'm gonna take this moment to acknowledge that we're presenting this seminar from Non-GMO Project offices in Bellingham, Washington on the beautiful unceded ancestral lands of the Lummi Nation, the Nooksack tribe and the Coast Salish people who've been stewards of this area for thousands of years. I'd also like to acknowledge that our food system has been built by many communities of color and that we as an industry still struggle with inequity and systemic bias. Today, we're really grateful you all joined us. This is our second annual June Dairy Month celebrating non-GMO dairy at a time when more and more synthetic dairy is being developed using GMO precision fermentation. We're excited to dig a bit deeper this year into the true leading edge of food production in dairy, organic, regenerative, non-GMO, grass-fed dairy. As we'll discuss in the next hour or so, GMO synthetic dairy is being created and marketed basically around two value propositions. It's better for animal welfare, it's a meaningful climate action, and we're going to tell you why the better alternative to conventional dairy is not GMO synthetic dairy, but actually regenerative traditional dairy, which we think is a far superior solution if we are truly worried about how to fix all the problems created by conventional industrial CAFO based dairy. Today, we're at a bit of a crossroads. Technologists are telling us we need to create sustainable food solutions and that technology should replace agriculture. But we believe agriculture can itself be the solution when it's regenerative and holistic. In a bit, we'll talk in more detail about why we're concerned about synthetic lab-grown dairy products and why we know there's a better way that really makes use of our best tools to address issues like climate change, soil health, biodiversity, animal welfare, fair pay to farmers and farm workers, and so on. And to do that, you're not going to have to take my word for it. As I mentioned, most of today's conversation is going to be a roundtable discussion with three pioneers of this regenerative solution. Our good friend Albert Strauss of Strauss Family Creamery, Lynette Mann from New Zealand's Lewis Road Creamery, and Adrian Bota of Origin Milk. So here's a snapshot of where we're going today. First 20 minutes or so, we're just going to give you an update on GMO synthetic dairy, how both new and old GMOs have been used in the dairy industry. And we'll do a quick refresher on where shoppers are at in terms of their preferences and the kinds of attributes they're looking for when they're standing at the dairy cooler. This is going to include some sales trends, and there's some pretty energizing news to share about that. What I like to call dairy done right is definitely having a moment and GMO synthetic dairy appears to be struggling to find shoppers. So let's have a quick refresher on where the dairy industry has been, how some of these new dairy GMOs are being made, and we'll get a status check on GMO synthetic dairy today. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda Cognato. She's our senior analyst who heads up our research department. She publishes a quarterly biotech monitoring report that we use internally here at the Non-GMO Project. And she's the author of our excellent monthly newsletter, which we call New GMO Alerts, New GMO Alerts, which anyone can sign up to receive to get regular updates on what we're seeing from biotech, biotech developers in the food industry. Linda could not join us in person today, so we've pre-recorded her part of today's seminar. So now, Barring any technological issues, we're going to hear from Linda. 
Thank you, Hans. Good morning, everyone. As we start, I just want to give you a brief overview of the differences between traditional GMOs and new GMOs. As you likely know, most of the corn and soy grown in the U.S. is fed to livestock, and much of that corn and soy is genetically modified, and that's modified for either herbicide tolerance, insect resistance, or both. And these are what we think of as traditional GMOs. New GMO techniques, primarily CRISPR, have facilitated the development of new ways to create novel proteins, and that includes dairy proteins. So this is actually creating dairy proteins without the cow. These novel dairy proteins are being created using both synthetic biology, which is also known as Symbio or precision fermentation, as well as molecular farming. And I will um, talk a little bit about both of those now. So in the marketplace, Symbio or synthetic biology refers to the practice of genetically modifying microorganisms, and that's yeast, algae, or bacteria, in order to produce these novel products, such as dairy proteins. It's important to remember that although not specifically regulated in the U.S., Symbio microorganisms and their derivatives, such as dairy proteins, are considered to be GMOs by the non-GMO project. On the other hand, molecular farming is the practice of genetically modifying plants, and those plants could be tobacco or pea or soy, in order to produce novel recombinant proteins. And those proteins are often animal-derived proteins. So these proteins can be synthesized out of the plant once it is harvested, and as is the case with dairy proteins, or the proteins can be used to augment the inherent value of the plant, for example, to boost the protein level of soy or pea protein isolate once the plant has been harvested. So in the first case, you have microorganisms that are being genetically modified to produce these proteins. In the second molecular farming, you have plants that are being modified in, by incorporating animal DNA in order to have those plants produce animal products. So here we have a list of a number of developers and companies and brands that are involved in um, either making these Symbio dairy proteins or these are companies or brands that have embraced these proteins and are using them in products. Some of these names are names that you'll recognize, may recognize, such as Perfect Day. Others might be totally new to you because you have not encountered them in the marketplace. And it's also important to note that there are a few companies here that are actually involved in using molecular farming rather than Symbio, and those are the ones that are um, have asterisks. So just a brief marketplace overview, where are these products showing up? Many of these products are showing up in several key dairy categories, including milk, frozen desserts, and cheese. And these are things that one might expect to find um, dairy proteins. But they're also debuting in other products, such as protein powders, baked goods, cake mixes, chocolate bars, and protein smoothies. And many of these products are using these dairy proteins, um, in some case as a replacement for an actual dairy product, in some cases as a replacement for egg, um, in a, for example, in a cake mix, and others are just to, to augment the protein available through protein powders. More animal-free dairy proteins are on the horizon. We are seeing new companies launch every week, and we're also seeing new companies embrace the use of these animal-free dairy proteins in their products. It should be noted that cost is still not competitive. For example, a brief search um, found animal-free dairy milk that ranged from $6 to $26 for a quart. And as you'll note, this is well above even um, anything that you would find, um, for example, for a gallon of organic milk. 
There's also a shift in terminology away from animal free dairy or whey, which was the terminology that was used when these products were initially launched, um, to something more obscure, such as whey protein from fermentation, non animal dairy, or even plant based, which is really difficult, will make it difficult for consumers to identify where these ingredients are showing up in products. So here are some lists of where they are showing up in products. Um, and these are the various brands that are now, most of these are in the marketplace today. There are a few that have been, were launched and have been paused, but most of these are products that you can find in the grocery store today that feature these animal-free dairy proteins. And also just a few of the terms that you should become familiar with. As I said, some of these are traditional terms such as precision engineer, precision fermentation, synthetic biology, but some of them are, are more obscure such as plant-based whey protein or in some cases plant-based. And it really doesn't allow consumers uh, to make knowledgeable informed choices. It's also important to note that a number of these products, in addition to having general sustainability claims, a number of these products will also be labeled as natural or non-GMO or GMO free. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Hans. All right. I think that went pretty smoothly there. Let's see if I can get my video turned back on. Excellent. And we, I see we are getting some questions that are of a technical nature around um, synthetic biology. And unfortunately, because Linda isn't here, I can't offer, I won't be able to offer technical answers to those questions, but do encourage you, if you have technical questions that, that I can't answer um, on the project side, reach out to us and we'll get you in touch with uh, Linda for uh, specific questions around genetic engineering techniques. Okay. So as I mentioned, that was Linda Cognato. Um, she is our senior research analyst. The project has a team of full-time researchers and they're watching a virtual explosion of development in this area as more tech, tech companies try to enter the natural food industry, driven in part by uh, President Biden's executive order on biotechnology last fall, which is driving a lot of taxpayer funding into supporting the development of, of GMOs like this. Because so many of these companies don't share details about how they use genetic engineering, their supply chains, biohazardous waste, and their processes, we have to dig deeply into them and get beyond their marketing and PR hype. A special note here that Linda touched on, some of these companies are even, even starting to call themselves plant-based, all in an effort to avoid disclosure of GMO brewing and industrial processing. With so much of this misleading messaging, the only way to be truly sure that a non-traditional dairy product isn't genetically engineered is to look for the butterfly. So six reasons why we're concerned about synthetic animal, animal free dairy. We have a lot of questions because there is a real lack of transparency. What we do know from our research team is that our concerns are well-placed. First, synthetic dairy is being developed by technologists, not food companies, not by farmers, and it's being funded by tech venture capitalists. Second, the goal of synthetic dairy is to put traditional dairy farmers and farm workers and even whole communities out of business. That is outdated thinking, that sustainability is only about the environment. Without social and economic sustainability, you don't really have a solution. Third, isn't this just the next chapter of industrialized agriculture? You cannot create something from nothing. Synthetic dairy is created using cheap sugar sources, sources like high fructose corn syrup or GMO sugar beets. And those are grown with the same fertilizers and pesticides and greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuels. It's still conventional agriculture that just gets finished in a fermentation tank. All they're eliminating is farmers and cows. Fourth, this process definitely creates huge volumes of biohazardous waste. Where does that go? It probably has to be either incinerated or boiled or acidified, which involves a lot more fossil fuels. Fifth, as for nutrition, these products end up being highly processed 
and nutrition is likely to be through supplements. And finally, when we do see some of these products in grocery stores, as Linda mentioned, the price, ta price tag is often astronomical. In the end, we have to ask ourselves how synthetic dairy actually fits into this conversation. How does it directly improve soil health? How does it sequester carbon? How does it build biodiversity? This is why we say if synthetic dairy is sustainable, then sustainability is not enough. In fact, we have a much better solution to all of these issues, and it's already here, organic, regenerative, grass-fed dairy. So it's a great time in this presentation to consider the question, why does there seem to be so little shopper demand for these synthetic dairy products, while interest in organic, regenerative, and non-GMO dairy is strong and growing? So next couple of slides, we'll talk about shopper research. More than 50% of North American shoppers are looking for non-GMO dairy products, even more than are looking for organic and grass-fed, but of course, these are all highly complementary emerging attributes and certifications. I'm really excited to get to our panel to talk about what's really now, I think, the gold standard for dairy. If you're looking for products with the maximum benefit for farmers, animals, eaters, and the planet. And as far as what's motivating shoppers to look for the butterfly, the numbers are pretty strong. Six out of 10 have doubts about eating lab-grown fermented uh, foods that are produced in a factory. Two-thirds believe GMOs should be labeled, and that would include synthetic dairy, which is not today required to be labeled as a GMO. And almost nine out of 10 trust the non-GMO project butterfly. And you know what? The sales numbers strongly correlate to these preferences at the dairy cooler. These are the most recent sales numbers from spins. And while fluid milk sales have been relatively stable, level, maybe even declined a little bit when you factor in conventional milk, the growth of full fat dairy outside of fluid milk is very strong indeed. Some of you might have been present at Expo West where we heard that the sale of regenerative organic products is growing exponentially. That was data shared by spins during the panel, Nutrient Density, the Consumer Case for Regenerative, which was facilitated by Megan Westgate, the Non-GMO Project's executive, editor, uh, executive director. What we heard during that panel and the analysis of the sales data suggests that shoppers are really attracted to regenerative organic products, and they're willing to pay a pretty significant premium to get them for their families. There's emerging thinking that says shoppers are interested in getting the most nutritional bang for their buck in the nutritional profile of the foods that they're buying. And there's growing evidence that healthy soils produce nutrient dense foods, and that includes dairy. In fact, some of the most convincing science has already been done on regenerative grass fed dairy that suggests that these types of products pack a serious punch of omega threes and conjugated linoleic acid. And that's just two nutrients that are great for brain development, heart health, and joint health. So this type of dairy really looks like it's gonna be better for soils, for farmers, for livestock, for shoppers, and for the planet. Okay, so to wrap up this quick overview, here are six reasons why we think non-GMO matters in the dairy cooler. First, non-GMO project verification is the only way you can be sure that a traditional milk product or an animal-free animal milk product has not been produced using new or old GMOs. Second, buying non-GMO dairy is one of the most powerful ways to influence how farming is done in North America. Corn, as, as Linda pointed out, is the single most common GMO commodity crop and most of that acreage in North America is going to livestock feed, including dairy cows. Sourcing and buying non-GMO creates demand for farmers to convert more of their acreage away from GMOs. Third, as should be clear from what Linda told us, new GMOs are constantly being developed and the non-GMO project monitors and tracks all of this development to make sure that they don't sneak in to the natural food system. Fourth, RGBH, the old bugaboo of the, uh, of the conventional milk industry, is a GMO. It's a newer GMO created through a synthetic biology type of technique. It's still being used in some corners of the conventional milk world. 
it's prohibited by the non-GMO project standard. Fifth, when you source and buy non-GMO, you're actually supporting small-scale family farms because they receive better prices. And finally, going non-GMO is a great way to support farmers that are trying to transition to better systems like organic, regenerative, and grass-fed dairy. We often speak about non-GMO as being the on-ramp to a better food system. The first thing you have to do if you're a farmer who aspires to go organic is you've got to stop planting GMO commodity crops and spraying them with pesticides and herbicides. And with that, it's my pleasure really to get to the real experts, our friends from Strauss Family Creamery, Origin Milk, and Lewis Road Creamery. So if our friends could join us on camera, that would be awesome. Albert, good to see you. Adrian, welcome. And Lynette will be joining us here as well. Lynette, are you able to turn your camera on? We don't have Lynette on camera yet. There we are. We've got the, that beautiful New Zealand backdrop. We, we definitely want to see you. So maybe we'll just start with introductions. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your farms, your brand, your brand story. Uh, love to introduce you to our audience. Um, some of you may uh, know these brands and love them as much as we do, but we want to hear really um, from from straight from the cow's mouth, shall we say, rather than the horse's mouth, what your what your special stories really are. And Albert, um, you're our old friend. You joined us last year. Maybe we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about what's going on at Strauss Family Creamery, a little bit of the history, um, what makes uh, Strauss Family Creamery so unique and, and, and lovely. Thank you, Hans. Thank you for inviting me to this to this panel and conference. Um, so I'm Albert Strauss, founder and CEO of Strauss Family Creamery. We were the first certified organic dairy and creamery west of the Mississippi River in the beginning of 1994. First 100% organic creamery in the United States. Um, since then, 85% uh, of the dairies in Marin Sonoma County above San Francisco are certified organic and 12 dairy supply are creamery, um, yeah, including my own. Um, so we've been working, our mission is to sustain family farms in Marin Sonoma County by providing high quality, minimally processed organic dairy products and help revitalize rural communities through education advocacy everywhere. And our, our vision is to create an economically viable organic dairy farm model that's good for the planet and our communities while providing high quality food locally and regionally. Um, I have a goal to be carbon neutral by the end of this year on my dairy. And we have a, a incentive plan to be carbon neutral with the rest of our 11 other dairies by the end of the decade. And so, um, I can go into more of that, but I'll keep the in introduction a little bit shorter. Thank you. Yeah, well, Albert, you've got all kinds of interesting th things going on your farm, including pioneering the use of, I believe, seaweed as a cow feed, which is fascinating to me. And I, I'd be remiss to not point out that the your backdrop is a painting of your of the of the family farm, correct? Right. Um, yeah, and I mean, if you ask me, the the four elements to be carbon neutral are. Um, we were the first dairy in the United States to have a carbon farm plan, which is a rebranding re as regenerative. So by adding compost to the land, using animals to intensively rotational graze, planting hedgerows and windbreaks, you're pulling carbon from the atmosphere and putting it back in the soil. It's being recognized internationally as one of the only ways to reverse climate change rather than reduce it. My assertion is livestock have an essential role in reversing climate change. Second part is we have a methane digester. When we collect the manure from the cows while they're eating or milking, um, we for the last 19 years, we've been capturing that gas that comes off the lagoons and using it as a fuel for producing all electricity for our farm. And a couple of years ago, we collaborated with BMW to take advantage of the low carbon fuel standard in California that incentivizes renewable electricity and pathway to electric vehicles. So we're selling carbon credits on the market and creating an alternative income source for farmers. And then we were the, uh, it's about a little over, almost two years ago, we became the first commercial trial for feeding red seaweed to cows 
in the United States uh, by feeding a quarter pound in a 45 pound diet, you can get up to 95% reduction in, in methane, enteric methane emissions from the cows, um, belches, not the farts. Um, and um, so it's now between those three practices uh, will be our farm will have a, the milk coming from our farm will have an equal or lower carbon footprint than any plant-based dairy alternative. And um, and the last thing is that I, uh, seven years ago, I converted our truck that feeds our cows to fully electric with ideas cows are powering the truck that feeds them. And we converted a, a full-scale John Deere loader to electric two years ago. Getting off fossil fuels is the other part of the plan. So that, that's amazing. You know, oftentimes I hear people talk about organic uh, foods, organic dairy being food produced and grown the way our grandparents and great grandparents did. And Albert, I think you made a pretty good case that there is significant innovation going on in this space. So I should I should tie it into the non-GMO project because in 2005 I found GMOs in our certified organic corn started our own testing and verification program. And then when the non-GMO project was ready, it became the first dairy in North America to be non-GMO verified by testing and verifying every ingredient to make sure they're not GMO. So excellent. That's, that's which, so. which answers, which actually answers a question we get often, which is, is an organic certification good enough? And what we have seen is there is contamination going on uh, with uh, GMO feeds, for example. And um, and the National Organic Program isn't actually keeping up with some of these new developments um, like synthetic um, synthetic dairy and other GMOs that are coming online without really being equipped to handle them. So we really appreciate your commitment to both non-GMO and organic certification. Adrian, let's hear uh, let's hear the story the, the interesting story about Origin and all the fine work that that uh, your organization is engaged in. Thank you, Hans, and thank you, Albert. Um, I should say that Albert has really been um, just such a, a trendsetter, and he has gone before so many of us in the dairy world. Um, you've heard of all the things that they have done to ensure that we're moving beyond sustainability in the dairy world, um, and we're hitting things like soil health and nutrient density, uh, et cetera, um, probably before the term regenerative even became a term. and and you know, he has blazed that trail that so many of us are following in those footsteps. And I think it speaks to um, something really loudly to me is that if we want to see wholesale change, if we want to undo, uh, frankly, um, the harm that has been done, whether it's uh, from one industry or another, um, we can't do it without innovative dairy farmers. Um, we can't do it without folks who look at the entire living ecosystem and have an approach that can connect the dots between what happens in the soil to the animals um, and then to the larger environment as a whole. Um, and it's it just takes an ecosystem uh, approach to accomplish that. But we have to connect that back to the consumer. So anyone that's listening that's on this um, that's participating in this webinar, um, the consumer just has such a pivotal role in this because when you do all the things that Albert is talking about that he implemented way before it was cool um, there in those counties in California, when you implement those things, that is going to equal a product that is better for human health and for nutrition, uh, better for the planet, better for animal care, better for the regenerative economic systems that we want to build around our food, um, which there are very few things that are more important, more precious than our food systems to us. But to do that, you have a consumer that understands that those inputs, the costs uh, uh, to accomplishing that is going to equal something that's not, you know, $2.99 a gallon milk. And, and what I think is important about what Albert is saying is really helping folks to understand that if we want to do it right, if we wanted to go back in time, as you mentioned earlier, Hans, and produce milk as it was by our you know, grandparents and great grandparents, et cetera, if we want to benefit from all that, we have to also retrain our thinking around what does this cost us? And this is not just in dairy. Um, it's in all the things that we consume that we're either putting into our bodies or putting onto our bodies. Uh, and I think we've been trained oftentimes ourselves um, in dairy or in any other industry uh, to pay a certain uh, uh, pay a certain price, and I think where Origin um, comes in is to say we need to reframe the conversation 
because we're I, we're going to be paying for it one way or another. We're either going to be paying it today um, or we're going to pay for it down the road, whether it's for the environment or our own personal health. And paying close attention to things like the regenerative movement, um, to ensuring that we're producing things in an organic matter, to ensure that we're producing things in a non-GMO um, fashion, and paying attention to what others are trying to bring into our food system is incredibly important. Um, it's a way that we can um, uh, protect ourselves, uh, protect our children, protect the environment, um, and as one of the slides mentioned, protect all of the other stakeholders or components of that living ecosystem. Um, and so when I look at it and when Origin comes to this table, we wanna say, we wanna look at what has been done wrong and say, how can we correct? Uh, and we don't wanna overcorrect by pushing aside, say large ruminant animals who help us to become regenerative, who work the land, who sequester carbon, um, who bring the manure that then helps us to increase um, the, uh, the organic matter within that soil, regenerating that soil. We want to look at an approach that is not just sustainable, because if we're sustaining, we're not doing enough, right? Um, we're not talking about, you know, Al Gore 25 years ago, you know, um, global warming. That was nice. And that's great. It was, it was good. It was eye-opening for many people. But we're not talking about, we're moving from degenerative systems that literally degenerate the soil and soil matter soil from um, we move from those degenerative systems into above and beyond sustainability into regenerative systems and what Lynette and what Albert uh, have talked about and we'll be talking about are those types of systems and you cannot accomplish that um, if uh, if you're if you're implementing uh, symbio solutions um, and if you're taking what nature already does well and trying to do it in a different way, in a, uh, in a in a sort of by putting human wisdom behind it, as opposed to saying, hey, let's let it be the way it is. And at Origin, what we believe in is simply um, implement organic, non-GMO, regenerative or organic certified systems and bring food and nutrition products to consumers um, that they can have a high level of confidence in knowing was done at the highest quality um, and we want to try to reframe uh, from just thinking about dairy as another food, milk that you have with your cereal, to have people be um, very intentional, intentional about their, the way that they're consuming dairy. Look at dairy not just as a food, but as a nutrition source. And if you think of food as nutrition and nutrition at the core of our healthcare, then we'll reframe um, what we're putting into our bodies. We'll reframe the role of farmer and look at more of our farmer physicians um, and lean on their wisdom and the work that they're doing to create healthy pastures, uh, healthy cows, giving us healthy nutrition for our bodies that will help us to thrive. Um, and that's what Origin is all about. Excellent. Thank you for that, Adrian. Well, we're really lucky to have somebody speaking to us literally from the future with Lynette and New Zealand. What can you tell us about the future and how that <laughs> looks in New Zealand, Lynette? Tell us a bit about Lewis, Lewis Road Creamery. And oh, well, your, amazing story, over here. <laughs> your amazing story and uh, your farms and the rest of it. Um, let's let the world know more about Lewis Road. Ah, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I guess Lewis Road Creamery is New Zealand's little um, premium dairy brand, consumer brand. Um, it's owned by um, Southern Pastures. Um, which has 19 dairy farms um, and very in two very um, sweet uh, climate um, sweet spots in New Zealand. Um, not all of New Zealand can farm um, 365 days free range, but that's what we are able to achieve. Uh, we do that because um, we want to have the pasture to plate truth. Um, and we believe in improving the soils and leaving it better for the next generation. So we um, we do farm regeneratively, but we farm slightly differently, I guess, um, than um, maybe everyone on the panel here. Um, but purely that's just down to where we are in the world, I think, um, plus our value system. So uh, we do nurture the soils. Um, the more we improve the soils, the more water it can hold, the more poop that stays in the loop, and the more mouldy species we have in pastures um, has different root systems that can 
um, replenish everything within the soils. Um, so therefore there's less inputs needed to go on. So um, the microbiome in the soil is healthier. Um, therefore, we as humans that eat the food that comes off those should be healthier as well for our own gut health. Um, so that that that's I guess in a nutshell what we what we believe in in New Zealand we have um, a full range of products in um, and why it's and um, why we love having it uh, the butterfly on our stamp uh, the but sorry the butterfly stamp on our um, on our butter which goes into the US um, is that it does provide consumers with um, a reason to. Um, understand what we're all about and then they dive in further so it's um it's beneficial definitely for us to have that there excellent well i'm hearing a lot of conversation about carbon sequestration obviously um existential crises of our time are really climate change and loss of biodiversity and i do want to talk about the biodiversity that you all are seeing on your farms as a part of these regenerative systems. But before we get to that, the other thing that we know people are concerned about uh, is animal welfare. And having grown up on an organic dairy farm myself, I see the special connection that farmers often have with their animals, symbiotic relationship. Adrian, you already touched on the fact that if we're not using manure and natural composts, we're likely having to use synthetic fertilizers in growing our crops and growing our food, we're, we're degrading the quality of our soils. Best, most natural way of rebuilding soil health is uh, through natural manures from livestock. But I'm curious specifically what y'all's experience is on farm in terms of what is done in these systems to assure that animals can express their best natural behaviors. We often hear happy cows produce happy milk or good milk. Um, what evidence do you have of that on the farm? What do you see? Uh, uh, what are the practices on farm? And I know it's a little bit different uh, between New Zealand and organic standards are a little bit different internationally. And there is occasional use of antibiotics in some, uh, in some systems outside of the U.S. But beyond that, I'm just curious, and maybe we'll start with you, Albert, in, in your long history of, of dairying, um, uh, what your view of animal welfare is and, and what, what's built into your systems to ensure healthy, happy uh, animals. Oh, sorry, I guess you're, you must be on mute, Albert. I, I made that mistake myself. Um, thanks. Um, well, I feel that certified organic farming animal welfare is a primary tenant of it. And a lot of the single label claims talk about one aspect of certified organic. And so we've been practicing organic practices um, where cows are on pasture um, uh, as, as much as uh, they can't be. So the organic standards say the cows have to be have access to pastures and outdoors, uh, even milking cows for they have to maximize the time they're on pasture with a minimum of 120 days on green pastures. But um, they have to be out all year long. We have you know four to six months of green pasture a year where they have nutrition in the grass. But even when they're, there's not nutrition, we have to supplement them more. They have to be out on 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 open uh, on the pastures and in open land. So um, so I feel that's uh, and they have to be on pasture from the time they're at least six months of age. So it's something that I feel is a tenant of organic farming and dairy farming as well as uh, humane treatment. Um, I'll stop there for right now. Adrian, what about you? How do how do you uh... You're in the store, your product's there, shoppers are there, they ask you, they make comment like, I'm really concerned about animal welfare. I feel we're exploiting these animals. Um, how do you, how would you respond in that kind of scenario? For me, it's very simple. There's a uh, very intricate interdependency um, between the family farm, the family dairy farm, small dairy farmers, and the health and well, welfare, wellness of the cows. Um, and so because we don't work with large, um, large operations, every single one of the farms in our network are small family farms. 
um, we can count on the fact that the, the two are so interdependent. The farmers depend on the cows uh, for their livelihood. And so talk about seeing the ROI on happy, healthy cows. They see it on a day to day to day basis. They spend, you know, sometimes more time with those with those cows than with their families um, from, you know, 435 in the morning until late in the evening. And we're milking once or sometimes twice a day. Um, we're monitoring the health of the cows. We're seeing the levels of milk that are coming. We're seeing the young that are growing next to the um, the young calves that are growing next to 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 moms and so if those cows are not happy and healthy it's going to impact that family's well-being and so the greatest check the greatest level and form of accountability that we have outside of standards that are implemented which is great for us to all have standards that we can agree on and be held accountable to the the greatest thing is to have family farms who are making their living um uh, and, and, and spending time with the cows every day, it is in their best interest um, for those cows to be healthy and for those cows to be thriving and for them to be well taken care of. And so we find that um, it's rare that we get any kind of report of cows um, being sick or being hurt. Accidents happen out on the field when they're pasture, you know, our cows are 100% grass fed. And so they're out on pasture, um, unless the weather doesn't permit, and then they're eating grass inside the inside the barn. Um, but it's this interconnection and a small family farm and, uh, and cows that keeps the system um, keeps the system going and uh, ensures that cows are healthy. Thank you, Adrian. You're breaking up a little bit there, but you're still with us, which is great. So I don't think we missed anything there. Lynette, what about you and your operation? You've been around cows probably your whole life. Um, can you speak to this relationship that farmers have with animals? And we should say that um, domesticated current cows have been bred over centuries of time in relationship with farmers and with human beings. And um, as you indicated, Adrian, um, their health is primary and that's why written into the our national organic program standard is maximizing optimizing natural behaviors for for letting these animals do what they do best and it's really interesting and we may get a chance to talk a bit more about 100 percent grass-fed products uh, and what it takes to convert uh, or transition um, cattle from a part grain ration to all grass a part of that question is no doubt um, uh, biodiversity, which is a question I want to ask you all next. But first, I want to hear from Lynette about special relationships between farmers and their animals, the critical role that animals play in the cycle, in a regenerative cycle of food production. Um, hmm, good question. So um, I guess you're right about, um, so, oh, I mean, we have obviously quite a few farms. Um, the families live on the farms um, and they are up close and personal with their cattle every every moment, really. Um, so we we actually have our own unique form of dairying um, certification that we've developed ourselves, which is independently audited. Um, and that takes into consideration all the five freedoms of animals, um, which I think is very important for, um, for consumers to understand. Um, we also have, as I said before, 365 days free range, um, GMO free. Um, we're 100% GMO free, um, certified and audited. Um, totally grass fed, pretty much we're above 99%. We have 1% that um, we can hold for um, climate changes. Um, we have no palm feed, soy feed, corn, those sorts of things, all again, great for animals and animal health and health and welfare. Um, we, yeah, we do actually um, have and antibiotic stewardship um, because the farmers find it very difficult to make that call between saving a cow's life. Um, but inevitably, most of the time, it's um, we can get through it without um, antibiotics. So there are no blanket antibiotics. 
and actually it's less antibiotics than the um, European Union standard. So um, it's minimal to that um, aspect. So I think cows and, and farmers really um, have a special bond, um, which is brilliant, yeah. I know on my family farm, you had instant feedback from every every cow. Every cow had a name. You could see if they had a nose, a dry nose or cold ears. And there are always, you know, these subtle signs in that kind of um, direct relationship, which I, I personally find a really beautiful thing. I want to talk a little bit now about biodiversity. And when I say biodiversity, really uh, the ask of our panel here is, do you see evidence of uh, of biodiversity really thriving on your farms? And, and here I'm partly talking about above the ground biodiversity. Do you see more animal life, more birds, uh, um, other ruminants on property, but also maybe more, even more importantly, um, biodiversity in the soil? We've heard a bit about having uh, organic matter uh, in the soil, the importance of composting and manures and so forth. Um, can you, can you all speak to that? And I'll just let any of you kind of volunteer to what your experience is. Some of the organic farms that I've been on are pretty stunning by comparison to maybe neighboring conventional farms in terms of crop rotations, in terms of the variety of grasses that are fed, especially on a grass, 100% grass fed farm where you've got different nutritional profiles for different kinds of grasses. So any of you want to speak to that? Um, maybe we can defer to our... Uh, the, the godfather of non-GMO dairying here, Albert first, maybe. What 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 do you see on your farms with respect to biodiversity? Well, it's interesting. Um, so we've been applying manures and compost to the land for 80 years. And um, our, uh, since we've been adding more compost and making more compost and adding more compost to the land, um, having metrics around um, actually by adding a quarter inch of compost, you can get uh, you can sequester one metric ton, ton per year per hectare for 20 years. So, but our organic matter is anywhere from six to 12 percent, where the average uh, organic matter in the soil is uh, one, two to three percent, I think, nationally. And so, what we saw during our 1200 year drought in the last couple of years is that we actually had more production of pasture and, and car crops than we ever had in the past. So it was a huge economic advantage for us. All these sustainability uh, um, practices actually have a, a quick financial return for farmers. And so that's so doing the right thing has a, has a financial reward as well as an environmental sound reward. So we adding organic matter to the soil, getting more nutrition in the soil, helps the crops, helps the biodiversity in different animals and plants. Um, and we are actually feeling, I'm feeling that we really are taking care of, better care of the land than we ever have in the past. Um, there was a question I wanted to just quickly answer was, um, our average herd size is about 250 cows on our farms where the, in California, I think it's, it's close to 2000 cows per farm. Um, so small farms that have uh, probably an acre per per cow um, uh, average, and, and um, during the pasture season, two thirds of the, the the nutrition that the cows are getting here is from pasture. There's less about ten percent is coming. Someone asked how much corn. It's about ten percent. So it's it's not a huge amount. Um, anyway, I want to answer that as well. Excellent. Adrian, you've got 100% grass-fed uh, milk um, with origin. Can you speak a little bit to um, uh, the challenges of being 100% grass-fed in terms of animal management, in terms of um, pasture management and so forth? Absolutely. So we we do have 100% grass-fed uh, animals and, and, and cows. And so what we really focus on is um, rotational grazing, intense uh, management of that rotational grazing, bringing cows back to um, a time before they were domesticated when, you know, large ruminant animals would walk and eat at the same time. It's part of their defense mechanism against, um, against predators, right? And so they naturally will do that. What we've bred cows to do is to stand or sit and eat. Um, and of course, they need to do that when they ruminate, but while they're eating, they should be moving. And so we work um, um, with our farmers to make sure that 
uh, we're constantly rotating um, uh, the cows on different pastures to get what they need and to get what they need most at the time that they know they need it. And they'll weed through what they want to eat when they want to eat. What's really important. I'm yeah. sorry. Well, I think what's, what's, what's also really important about biodiversity in the dairy world is something that we rarely talk about. Um, which is that about 94% of all dairy in America, and some say it's even higher, um, comes from black and white Holstein cows. And I know this is not really talked about very much. For us, it was a focus away from those Holstein cows to other breeds, heritage breeds. And so we focused initially on just the Guernsey breed. There are about 18,000 registered Guernseys left in America. The, Con the National Conservancy literally has the Guernsey uh, breed of cows on the endangered watch list. And so we're all about biodiversity in a way that has, isn't really thought about often, which is, hey, let's bring back heritage breeds like Dutch Belted or, or Guernsey or um, uh, Milking Shorthorn, Ayrshire, et cetera. Let's bring biodiversity at that level into the mix. And so that it's not 94, 95, 96% of dairy coming from one breed of cow, um, but let's bring back those, those dairy breeds that produce quality over quantity. And indeed, the U.S. did that very, very well um, before two major catalysts. One was the Great Depression and second, the, the second, uh, second World War, which meant that we had to now ration. And so it was all about quantity. It became about quantity at cer a certain point in dairy as opposed to quality. And a Holstein cow indeed gives you more of the quantity. Um, Lynette probably is, has got fewer Holstein cows there where she is um, mm -hmm. and uh, because that's... Th that's part of the heritage of, of New Zealand. And so we look at uh, holistic systems and how biodiversity can build. Um, and for us, it starts with the soil, moves to the breed of cows. And yes, it, it includes everything else. What's flying around us? What's burrowing into the ground? Um, we want, as part of a regenerative system, to encourage um, as much biodiversity as possible, whether it's on a dairy farm or in an apple orchard. Excellent. Well, we're almost at the top of our hour. I want to give the last word to our our uh, our Kiwi down there in New Zealand. I think mm -hmm. you all call yourselves Kiwis. I get, can I get away with that? We did have a question. <laughs> um, you mentioned the five freedoms for animals, and maybe by way of, of closing us out here, first you can tell us um, the breed uh, of cattle that are typically on your farms, and uh, and then maybe to answer a question, an anonymous question from our audience. Um, the five freedoms of animals. Oh, you're putting me to the test now. I am, um, yeah. <laughs> there's Google um, too. I mean, there's always Google, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh gosh, um, okay. So um, yes, we the breed of cow that we have here is, um, we call it a Kiwi cross, um, which is a cross between a Jersey cow, which is similar to a Guernsey cow, um, and it's that beautiful caramel colored cow, and um, a Frisian cow. So we get, it's all about genetics, I guess, but it's a, it's a great combination. Um, uh, the five freedoms would be freedom to move around, um, freedom to exhibit um, natural animal behaviors, um, freedom, oh, gosh, you're putting me to the test. You might, uh, have, sorry, to, well, you might have to Google. Everyone them. has Google, probably freedom, um, from, freedom from pain and unnecessary suffering. And suffering, um, yeah. Uh, oh, you'll have to help me with Google, someone, <laughs> please. Uh, but yeah, um, I, gu I guess it just becomes very natural to us, um, but we we definitely, um, it's it's the five freedoms that we, we take on board. So um appreciate right. that. Thank you all for joining us today. It's really been awesome. And what I really hear from this conversation is dairy done in this way is about optimizing systems, not maximizing systems. Adrian, you, you pointed to the fact that at, at some point, um, in our history, in North America in particular, we wanted to maximize yields uh, at whatever cost. We also made reference to um, what we now think of as being externalized costs, costs to our health, our food is less nutritious, costs to our soil, which has been degenerated. Um, and those two things are directly connected, right? Less nutrition in the soil, less biodiversity in the soil, less nutritious food, 
we all think that food ought to be cheap, but then we have to look at, well, where are we externaling, externalizing costs, right? So I hear all of you speaking to this issue of really optimizing systems, optimizing uh, uh, animal health, um, preventative health care so that they live their best uh, animal lives and, and, and are able to express their natural behaviors. Closed systems, we're reincorporating uh, manure from the cattle, which is an absolutely necessary component to, to the for natural fertility of soils. Um, so we've, we've touched on a lot today. It was awesome to have you all join the panel. Um, I think we covered most of our uh, most of our questions that came in. If we didn't answer your question, by all means, you can reach out directly to the project info at nongmoproject.org, and we will connect you with uh, with one of these uh, with one of these uh, experts that we have. Wanted to mention our campaign the whole month of of June Dairy Month. We're campaigning on behalf of uh, farmers and friends uh, like our panel here. You can see some of the materials that we presented in the webinar today, six reasons why um, dairy, uh, non-GMO dairy is better with the butterfly. Uh, we have a whole media kit if you happen to be a brand or a retailer and, and you're looking for some content to support Dairy Month, that's available to you. Um, and we also have a quick sort of fact, uh, fact sheet if you're interested in learning more, educating yourself more about where these new GMOs are showing up uh, in synthetic, uh, in, in, uh, in the dairy aisle in particular, but more broadly in food and in personal care. And I think we've got just more one slide left here for just contacts. Um, presentations like this are partly um, uh, supported by donations. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, based out here in Bellingham, Washington. So we really uh, appreciate any uh, donation support that we can get. It helps us do the research and, and create presentations like this. If you are a dairy brand or you're buying dairy uh, as an ingredient in your product, you're not yet verified. You can learn more about what it takes to go through the process of getting verified at getstarted.nongmlproject.org. And last, uh, but certainly not least, stay connected. Um, we know there's a lot of like-minded folks out there. Um, we know the butterfly is well-loved. If you want to um, reach out to us, we're real people. We're passionate. Um, we share a lot of the same values as you all do. We have a number of newsletters. They won't flood your inbox. It only comes out once a month, but we have the new GMO alerts. If you're just a shopper wanting to stay up to date on what's going on in our world, we have uh, a shopper newsletter, we've got a retailer newsletter, and we've got a newsletter for brands in the industry who uh, uh, want to be a part of this, this uh, natural foods coalition that we've managed to build here in the last 15, 16 years. So with that, I hope everyone has an awesome afternoon. Uh, Lynette, for you, I hope you have a great day. Go have your first cup of coffee if you haven't yet. And uh, we will all be in touch sometime soon. Thank you again to all of our panelists, Albert, Adrian, Lynette, really grateful that you joined us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.